In this video, I want to review some of the primates that are alive today and talk a little bit about how all of these primates came to be. As I said in class the other day, a lot of times when we think about what it means to be human, we think about all the ways we're special and all the ways that we're unique, but a lot of that, a lot of those characteristics that we think are unique are actually things that we share with other primates. So let's quickly just run through some of the primates that are alive today and how we sort these primates into different groups, because I think you'll start to see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of very human looking things in some of these primate groups. So first of all, the people who study primates are called primatologists, and primatologists study these non-human primates not only because primates are cool and we want to understand uh, their ecology and their behavior, but also to make inferences about the life history of our own species and our own closest living relatives and our closest ancestors. So in this picture is Diane Fossey, who is one of the most famous primatologists who has existed. Uh, her work was primarily with mountain gorillas in Uganda, and she was working in the 1970s and 1980s, and she was very influential in understanding gorilla behavior and also uh, pushing for conservation because gorillas are an extremely endangered species. They're affected by, um, by logging and deforestation and also by poaching, so illegal hunting. Um, gorilla, you know, gorilla body parts are incredibly uh, prized souvenirs that can be bought particularly by Westerners. Um, and so people will hunt gorillas to you know, create these souvenirs to fill that market. Uh, Diane Fossey was, uh, was really making strides with her conservation work, and she actually wrote a book called Gorillas in the Mist, which was about her research with these gorillas and uh, sort of the influence that they had on her as well. And this, this book was actually made into a movie called Gorillas in the Mist, starring Sigourney Weaver. As the movie was in production, uh, Diane Fossey had, was sort of acting as a consultant, I believe. Um, but, you know, through her conservation efforts to try to end poaching, she became a threat to those people who were involved in the poaching trade. And, unfortunately, she was, she was murdered for it. Um, so, you know, this, it's not a common occurrence for a primatologist to be murdered because of their work. But, you know, when, we have to realize that when we're, when we're studying other animals, even if they're not you know, even if they're not us, there are some pretty high stakes involved in this kind of research. But anyway, not to start on a sad note. Um, let's just quickly review some of these primate tendencies. We talked about some of these in class the other day. Some things that all primates have in common. So we all have these grasping hands and feet with our fantastic opposable thumbs. These we originally evolved because we lived, our ancestors lived in forests and they needed to be able to climb around on trees. It's much easier to climb around on a tree if you can wrap your fingers and thumbs entirely around a branch. And you can see on the right side of the screen all of these different primate hands. So even though there's variation amongst all of the primates, we all still have that basic same morphology of four fingers and a thumb, with the exception of maybe this little Columbus guy over here. He's, he's missing at least part of his thumb. We also see a shift in the importance uh, of certain senses in primates. So a lot of other mammals get the majority of their information about the world from their sense of smell. But we get most of our information from our sense of sight. And we can see how physically our bodies have adapted or have evolved to accommodate that particular sense. So if we look at other animals like horses or deer, we see their eyes are on the sides of their heads. But in primates, our eyes are facing directly forward. And this gives us a couple of advantages. While it does cut down on some of our peripheral vision, it gives us what we call uh, overlapping fields of vision or stereoscopic vision. And stereoscopic vision helps us with depth perception. And if you get, uh, think about you know, our earliest ancestors who were living in trees, much like this little guy up here, depth perception would have been very important as they were moving from branch to branch, and particularly for those animals that were jumping from branch to branch. If you're about to make a big leap from one tree to another, you want to make sure that you know that that tree is 5 feet away or 15 feet away. Um, you certainly don't want to be jumping without an accurate sense of how far away the thing you're jumping to is. That's a really good way to be uh, sort of selected out of the population. So our ability to see depth is definitely something that's rooted deep uh, in, our, in our primate lineage. We also gather a lot of information through our But the great thing about 
being required to invest more energy and more attention in our offspring is that this really gives them an expanded period of time in which they absorb all of those things that make it possible for them to live in their particular societies. So in humans, we refer to this as the enculturation period. Our kids become enculturated because they're constantly around us, because they need to be around us to be, order, to be able to survive. And the same thing goes for orangutans, like you see here on the left, or baby gorillas, or any baby primate. They have to be taken care of by their parents. All primates are also incredibly social. And in many primates, we see that this sociality uh, really bears out in the sharing of fruit or sharing of other food resources. So primates share their food with each other as a way of building social bonds. And they also groom each other a lot. That's a very, very social activity. Primates will spend hours sometimes picking bugs out of each other's hair, making sure that they're clean, and not only is there a practical benefit to this, but it does, again, foster this feeling of camaraderie or friendship amongst individuals, and it's a way that very strong social bonds can be maintained within larger and larger group settings. And if you think about humans, we are incredibly social. We have a whole thing called social media, right? We, are, we have taken this social aspect of primate life, and we've really blown it up. Um, and you can even think about some of the things that we do as a form of grooming, essentially, the same way that our primate relatives do. You know, if, we're, if we think about social media and Facebook and Instagram, whatever, every time, we, uh, every time we like someone's photograph or comment or, you know, every time we give someone some sort of feedback saying, I hear what you're saying, I recognize what you're saying, I agree with you, that's kind of like social grooming. It's kind of, you know, it has the same effect of saying, I am here and I am investing in you and investing in your well-being. And again, that activity helps create stronger social groups. Okay, so let's talk about the primates that are alive today and how they all got there. Um, to sort of set the stage a little bit, we have to go back in time, um, back about 65 million years ago. So 65 million years ago, the Earth looked like this. It, you know, it was starting to look the way the Earth looks today, but there were still some pretty significant differences. So North America and South America were not yet connected throughout Central America. So Central America just basically didn't exist. Um, Africa, hanging tight here in the middle, looks very much like Africa today. But then here's Asia and Europe connected to North America. India is just off floating by itself. Australia is also not quite in the same position or not quite the right position. Uh, our continents are constantly moving. They've been moving since the Earth was formed, since these land masses were first uh, solidified, and they're still moving to this day. But they're moving so, so slowly that we will never notice it in our lifetime, uh, nor will our children or our children's children. But this slow process of continental drift has affected the way that animals have evolved over the last you know, millions and millions of years. So anyway, to get back to primates, uh, our story starts here 65 million years ago at the end of the Age of Reptiles, this period of time called the Mesozoic Era. Uh, the Mesozoic lasted for over, you know, almost 200 million years, and it was the age of the dinosaurs. So this is when we see all of our T-Rexes and Brachiosaurs and Diplodocus and Stegosaurus and whatnot. And these guys were ruling the Earth. There were some small mammals who were alive at this time, but they definitely weren't the mammals that we see today. They weren't the mammals that at all really resemble what we think of when we think of mammals in the world that we live in. Uh, most of the mammals that were alive at this time were very small and rodent-like. Lots of them lived underground, and they were really the food for the dinosaurs. But mammals did not have any sort of high prominence uh, in the world at that time. Now, something big happened 65 million years ago. A meteor impact in the Gulf of Mexico, the Chicxulub meteor, uh, hits the Earth and massively disrupts the climate. This huge event has a big effect on the animals that are living on the planet 65 million years ago, and ultimately it leads to the complete demise of dinosaurs. When dinosaurs are wiped off the planet, uh, it's sort of 
opens a door for another group of animals, and those are the mammals. So those little tiny mammals that had been just the food for the dinosaurs for millions of years, those mammals now have a time to start to diversify, to start to fill in these ecological niches that were unavailable to them previously. So after 65 million years ago, this is when we call the age of the mammals, because we see mammals starting to gain a lot more ground on the Earth's surface. And just to, uh, just to sort of throw this in there, um, you know, we have these movies like Jurassic Park and just, you know, just now Jurassic World has come out. And these are some fun and exciting movies and bring up some interesting ideas about evolution and how things have happened. Um, certainly we know that Jurassic World is fiction and there has never been any period of time in which dinosaurs and Chris Pratt have gone on a hunt together. Um, some people believe that there has been a historical past in which humans and dinosaurs interacted. Uh, and so this sort of common figure of Jesus on a dinosaur is one that gets repeated a lot. But let me just state for the record right now, this never happened. Uh, absolutely never happened. Dinosaurs and humans have never, never, never lived at the same time. Because if dinosaurs had never gone extinct, we probably wouldn't be here. The fact that mammals, uh, you know, the, the the reason that mammals were able to diversify was because of that dinosaur extinction. So mammals, uh, mammals and dinosaurs, humans and dinosaurs, no overlap there. Uh, it would be it would be an interesting history, but no, didn't quite happen. Okay, so we're going to slowly build a cladogram as we go through each of these groups of primates, and you can see sort of the layout of where we're going. But we're starting here. Uh, with a group called the strepsorines, and these are our lemurs and our lorises. Our lemurs and lorises are a cute little sort of offshoot of primates um, that live in Madagascar and also in East Asia. The lemurs are a pretty well-known group of primates. They live only on this island of Madagascar off the east coast of Africa. They're extremely, extremely variable. There's dozens of different species of lemurs. They are diurnal and nocturnal, meaning that some of them are active during the day and some of them are active at night. They live in the trees and they live on the ground. Uh, they eat tons of different types of foods. Some eat fruits, some eat insects, and they're an incredibly diverse set of animals. They've also been around for a really long time. So this is a lemur fossil or a lemur ancestor fossil that's approximately 47 million years old. And we can see these same characteristics, these same very primate characteristics here 47 million years ago that we see in animals like ring-tailed lemurs and mouse lemurs today. Now lemurs are kind of an interesting group of animals because they only live on the island of Madagascar. They don't live anywhere else in, in the old world and certainly not in the new world. And it's kind of a mystery as to how they got there. But the best we can reconstruct is that some lemur ancestor around 50 million years ago somehow made it to Madagascar. Maybe it was a pregnant female who accidentally got stuck on a log during a big storm and washed from this east coast of Africa all the way to Madagascar. But once lemurs get here, they diversify. They spread out into all the different tiny little ecological niches that exist in Madagascar and they become very, very different. So this is a sort of unique instance of uh, rapid and diverse speciation of just one very particular lineage. Our other group of strepsorines are the lorises. These guys live in Southeast Asia. They're nocturnal, meaning they're only active at night. They mostly eat insects, which is what we mean when we say they're insectivorous, but some of them also eat fruit, so they are frugivorous. Um, and you can see this guy here, the slow loris. He looks perhaps a little less primate than some of the other uh, strepsorines, but these are some of these early strepsorines. All right, so when we look at the cladogram, when we see that the strepsorines are shooting off here into the lemurs and the lorises, what this is telling us is that this group was, is uh, sort of part of one of the oldest lineages of primates, and that there were many other primate groups that evolved and diverged after the time of these initial strepsorines. So our next group are the haplorines, and the haplorines include tarsiers on one side and also everything else. But first let's look at tarsiers. These are also from Southeast Asia. They're also nocturnal. For a long time anthropologists thought they were more closely related, related to the lemurs and the lorises, but now they are in a separate clade. 
Uh, tarsiers are very highly adapted to certain environments. And they also have these really creepy, skinny fingers, including one very specialized fingernail that we refer to as a toilet claw or a grooming claw. And these little guys do sometimes use these fingernails to groom themselves. They also use them to tap into trees and burrow for tree sap. So some of these tarsiers are what we call gumnivores, meaning that they eat gum or tree sap. All right, the next group of primates that we're going to talk about are called the anthropoids. And the anthropoids are pretty much everything else that we think of as primates. These live, uh, these originally evolved in the, in the old world, in Africa and Asia and in Europe. And they diverged from the strepsirines or the prosimians as they've sometimes been called, uh, well over 40 million years ago. These are the primates that are much more primate-like. And so we see an increased concentration on those things like manual dexterity, uh, increased memory function, increased sociality, that, again, that shift of uh, importance of sight over smell. We see that all happening more with the anthropoids. But it's also important to realize that with these early anthropoids, they still weren't like us. All right, here is an anthropoid fossil that's between 50 and 46 million years old. This is a complete lower jaw of one of these early anthropoids. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny. They're still very, very small anthropoids, and it would take several tens of millions of years before we get things that are even starting to resemble us. Uh, a particularly wonderful place to look for anthropoid fossils is here in Egypt. It's called the Fayum. Today, this is like the Sahara Desert. You know, there's sand, it's dry. It's not a place that we would typically think of for a rich primate habitat, but this is where we find all the great uh, early anthropoid fossils. The reason why we can find these anthropoid fossils in such a harsh desert environment is because 50 million years ago, it wasn't a harsh desert. It was a very lush forested area, but climates have continued to change over time. And so what was a dense forest can today be this you know, very harsh sort of Sahara desert environment.